Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Active Citizen Framework webinar. Want to take uh, want to thank you for joining us tonight as we talk about one of the best tools our organization has uh, to help us make an impact in our community. Uh, anytime that there are questions throughout, I'll try to watch uh, for um, hands to go up. Um, so if you can raise your hand. Uh, if you have a question, I will try to come back, come around and answer it as we go through. Our objectives for tonight are to first of all uh, understand what the Active Citizen Framework is, um, and as part of this, we will also address some challenges that we have for implementing the Active Citizen Framework in our chapters and come up with um, and demonstrate a project that has actually been um, done by chapters. And last but not least, we'll talk about some steps that you can take starting tonight to help implement this for your chapter. So the objectives of the Active Citizen Framework. What is it planned to do? What, what should you get out of it? Um, first and foremost, the Active Citizen Framework is built to empower uh, our chapters and our members to take ownership of their communities. And it provides a framework that we can use to come up with sustainable solutions that, so that we can measure what results we're actually having with our projects in our communities. And this framework aligns us locally, nationally, globally so that we can um, really strategically have a good impact in our communities and tackle some of the difficult problems that our communities are facing without having to take on too much of a role. But this is a way that we can chip away at some of those community problems by taking small, decisive actions uh, to really focus on what's causing the problem. So before we go too far, I want to talk a little bit about what active citizenship is. Active citizenship in relation to our organization are JCI members who first identify challenges, second engage the community, third take action, and fourth create sustainable solutions. So part of how we meet our mission is by using this active citizen framework. Our mission statement, for those of you who don't know, um, is to provide development opportunities that empower young people to create positive change. And by using the Active Citizen Framework, we truly are empowering our membership to create that positive change by using the, the tools that we have and we'll discuss tonight um, to empower them to make changes not only as a chapter, but to continue making changes even when they are no longer members of our organization so that we can have a bigger impact in our communities. For those of you who kind of want a visual of, of what the Active Citizen Framework is, uh, this kind of goes through how the framework works kind of from a uh, world view. Um, we start with JCI Impact Training. So for those of you who haven't taken JCI Impact, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, that course will talk about the Active Citizen Framework in three hours, so you get to really work um, as a group to kind of come up with um, some of the things, root causes, look at challenges in your community, and you can do it in more detail than we can really discuss it tonight in this format. So I highly recommend if you have the opportunity to take JCI Impact. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first step in using the Active Citizen Framework is to analyze community needs, followed by looking for sustainable solutions and root causes to those problems and what's causing the things that we need to, to address in our community. Next, once we formulated a solution, we take action. We build partners, and then we'll measure our results and see if we have made it made an impact or not, and how we should continue moving forward on those needs. So it's a continuous circle; it never really ends. So we're always looking for new projects. We're always looking for new challenges to tackle, 
So there's never a time where we kind of become stale. Our chapter is always doing something and always tackling a new challenge. So the first step that we need to do is identify what challenges we want to tackle. So how do we identify challenges in our community? Obviously, a lot of us see challenges every day. When we drive to work, we read the newspaper, we watch the news, we see things that are impacting our community. But that's only from our personal view. We also need to learn to talk to others, discuss with community leaders, uh, what are the challenges they're seeing? What are the things that they see from their perspective that we may not see that are challenges that uh, they wish they could handle, but they don't have the resources to do so? You can also look at community reports, uh, health reports and health statistics to see what kind of issues are impacting the health and well-being of our residents. We can try using community surveys. Uh, this is a good way to try to find out what's impacting people who aren't maybe leaders in the community, but are in different um, community groups that uh, maybe don't have as much representation in our community, but still have needs that need to be addressed. Look at what social programming your local government is offering and what is lacking from the social programming. Um, are, there th are there people who are falling through the cracks that we might be able to help? And look for themes in local projects. So if you have other groups that are running, running projects, are they running some things that uh, maybe we could tackle the root cause of the problem? For example, if you have a lot of, a lot of um, organizations that are providing clothing and shoes for kids in elementary schools, maybe we should look at the, challenge, the underlying challenge that's causing that, uh, that symptom. And we get a lot of benefits from needs analysis, not just identifying the challenge, but if we use needs analysis, um, we can use it to en engage our community. And it helps us understand more of what's going on, not just from our perspective, but from the perspective of the different groups within our, within our communities so that we have a better picture of what's going on. It also helps us identify potential partners, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, so when we actually go to doing a project, these could be partners who can help us make sure that our projects work successfully. By bringing people in of all different um, ethnic groups, backgrounds, uh, age groups, we foster more community pr uh, participation within our organization. So it gets us, it gets us out there and helps us um, build on what our, our successes are, but also work with other organizations so that we're pooling our resources and being a lot more effective and not wasting resources by doing the same project two different ways. And the last benefit that we get is that we can raise awareness about our organization. And in a lot of cases, I know our, our local organizations can use a little bit more um, awareness, especially when it comes to the the good that we can do and the, and the benefit we can be in the community. Community leaders don't necessarily look to us anymore um, for that kind of leadership. And so this kind of helps raise awareness of what we're doing and, and the impact that we can have when we work together. So who are you going to call? Who can you talk to as far as community leaders to start that conversation? Government officials are one that we often think of right away when we think of community leaders, but it's also nonprofit leaders, business owners, teachers, the local media, and don't forget our own alumni members, who are the people who've been, been a part of our organization, benefited from our organization, and have some good contacts and some good insight on the challenges that we're facing. How do we get those leaders to talk to us? Well, the big thing is, is we need to start reaching out to some of the leaders. And if you haven't, I highly encourage that you start making some phone calls and, and inviting the community leaders to talk, to talk to you about our organization and the Active Citizen Framework and how we can use the tool that we have to work with them to solve some of the problems that they're seeing in the community. And 
for anyone who's interested, uh, we do have a script of what you can to help you start make those phone calls. Um, just a simple calling, uh, even if it's in the evening when you know they may not be there, uh, call and leave a message and just introduce yourselves and talk about what you want to do and why you want to meet. Introduce the organization if you need to um, and try to schedule a time or get them to schedule a time to talk to you. 15, 20 minutes is all it takes and it can build a lasting relationship within your community. Plus, it can give you some good insight into the challenges that they see that are facing your community. Once you've come up with a challenge that you want to talk about, that you want to tackle, the next step is to determine the root cause. So if you think about it, determining a root cause is a lot like trying to diagnose what's wrong with a patient. So you want to find out what's truly causing the symptoms. Just because you have pain, we could treat the pain, but the pain's still going to be there. Instead, if we treat the pain, but also try to solve what's causing the problem. So if you're, if you're having a stomach issue and stomach pain, trying to figure out what's causing that stomach pain, that will be the better solution. And it's finding that root cause that, come, that helps us come up with a sustainable solution that truly solves the problem. But how do we find that solution and that cause? Well, first, <clears throat> we bring out our inner three-year-old and start asking the question, why? And you ask why a lot of times. You want to keep asking why until you figured out what it is that's caused the problem or some way that, that you can't act anymore. So if it's something that's out of your control or out of your hands that you wouldn't be able to handle, then you want to start looking at a different root cause. But in a lot of cases, we look at hunger, for example, or poverty. Uh, there's many root causes. There's many potential root causes. And so if we can find some of the different root causes and take them back to a smaller solution, we can come up with a, a sustainable solution that we can implement as a project in our chapter. One of the things we recommend for this process, um, not only just for your chapter, but also to kind of help build awareness and, and get community buy-in is to host a root cause workshop. This can be a one to two hour workshop where we brainstorm um, what are the root causes. And it doesn't have to be a big thing, but it can, but just invite your community leaders, invite members of the community and concerned citizens. Briefly talk about the active citizen framework and the root cause analysis, and then break people up into groups and have them brainstorm what potential causes, root causes there are for what, whatever problem that you're trying to tackle. Uh, if you bring those results back, you can look for commonalities and find out where you have the most buy-in to build a new project. One such example is, uh, was used in Illinois where they wanted to tackle child obesity. And so they worked together with partners um, to look at what were the uh, root causes. So, in the example here, we found that um, the first pass when we asked why, uh, why are kids obese? Uh, first answer was kids don't exercise or stay active. And the second, and a second reason why was that kids don't eat very healthy. Well, we took each of those and asked why again. So why don't kids eat healthy? Well, kids aren't provided healthy meals. Kids don't like healthy foods. Parents don't know about what foods are healthy, and parents don't know healthy foods are important. There are more that could be there, but this is just an example. Um, so what you want to do is kind of map out what are some of those reasons why, and keep asking why until you come up with that root cause and something that, that you can tackle. So in this case, um, let's look at kids don't like to exercise. Well, some kids are unathletic. Some kids don't think it's fun. Some kids are afraid of smelly, messy hair. There's no time to clean up. There's no place to clean up. Is there anything that we could do to build a project to kind of allow kids more time 
or help them with with whatever might be the issue there. Um, if there aren't age appropriate equipment, we have what is what can we do to help provide exercise equipment that's more age appropriate? So it's kind of looking at the different asking that question and keep in taking it to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, until you come up with project ideas that can be sustainable solutions. So how do we define what a sustainable solution is? Well, first of all, it's a project or a series of projects that address a root problem. So it's not a project that you're gonna run every year. The idea behind this is that hopefully you're going to run this project once maybe two or three times at the most, or that you build a series of projects and that that will help solve the problem. And then it's done. Or someone else has taken, or as part of the project, you've built a group that's going to take on and, and continue running it. And the big thing is, is that we're focusing on long-term solutions. So one of the examples that uh, I see a lot of projects is we have a lot of food basket programs, which are, are great programs. They provide needed food at holiday time and, and other times to make sure that people don't go hungry. Um, that's a short-term solution. It's a good project, but it's not focusing on the long-term reason why someone doesn't have um, enough food to put on the table for their family. So what can we do to focus on a long-term solution so that that family doesn't need food baskets anymore? As a part of the sustainable solution, we also need to seek commitments from our community partners so that they can help us address the problem and continue to follow up once we've moved on to another project. And we always can have uh, a greater impact when we're working together. The final, the final step of any project is the, is the step that we usually have no problem with in, in our organization. It's putting our plan into action. So once we have our project designed, uh, we want to make sure we have um, a good project team. But one of the important parts and one of the things that we need to do as part of that is to go back and look at what, what members of the community can we engage through this project. Um, and how can we locate and, and identify uh, some of the community partners that can help us make this project more impactful for our community. And so to talk a little bit more about that, I'm going to turn to JCI, who will talk a little bit more about finding partners and using partners as part of an active citizen framework project. The path to positive change isn't always easy. That's why we created the JCI Active Citizen Framework, a roadmap to finding sustainable solutions to challenges facing communities across the world. By identifying root causes of problems, building partnerships across sectors, and developing an effective plan to take concrete action, we believe everyone can create positive change. Discovering the root cause of community issues through needs analysis is just the first step to solving the biggest challenges in challenges in any community. The next step is taking action, but you need a few things before you can get started. Make sure your sustainable solution meets a need to keep JCI relevant in your community and motivate others to work with you in creating impact. Find people who are emotionally invested in the success of your project and get them to take initiative and work hard to achieve the goals of your project. Look for partners who share your common values, goals, and support the purpose of your project. Partners can be anyone whose expertise or resources could add value to your project. So be flexible and work on ways to create shared value for others. Finally, set goals to guide your specific actions toward a comprehensive solution. These will help you determine whether you've been successful or if you need to alter your efforts and try again. The JCI Active Citizen Framework has already been employed by several JCI organizations conducting projects that provide education and economic empowerment. In Bangladesh, JCI DACA West and Central are working together with the Bangladesh Institute of Information and Communication Technology and Development to provide local farmers with greater access to information they need. This helps them better plan their crops, resulting in less waste and higher profits, elevating the farmers out of poverty. 
students in Chisinau, Moldova have been learning about entrepreneurship and how they can become young active citizens by developing skills in leadership and management. Working with Junior Achievement Moldova, JCI members are empowering local youth to think creatively, act proactively, and take responsibility for the future of their community and economy. JCI Ghana is focusing on child education to reduce poverty and the number of children living on the streets. JCI Accra Elite partnered with the Street Academy to provide learning materials, organize social events, and donate resources to help homeless children get the education they deserve so they can one day become active citizens. Members plan on continuing the project for five years to ensure that homelessness is no longer an issue in Accra. From Bangladesh to Moldova to Ghana, JCI members are making strides to provide sustainable solutions to challenges they identify in their communities. By taking action, JCI members create positive change, touching lives and transforming the world one community at a time. So now that we know a little bit about the activism framework, how do we implement it into our chapters? The first thing we recommend is to look for someone who's um, an experienced member or a past officer who can kind of lead this process. Um, it, it helps to kind of have a project manager type person who's familiar with the organization and knows a lot of the membership and has some good connections with the community to kind of help spearhead this and help plug people in so they get the most out of this experience. Another idea is to talk to some of the community leaders that, that may have ideas for projects um, that may need to be run instead of looking for a particular community need. So this is something else where we can look at how our organization can plug in and help um, the community where we're where we're requested and, and make sure we're meeting a need that's that's there. Um, we also want to make sure that we are keeping our community partners and members informed of the progress um, of any workshops that we have. So if we do have um, a, a workshop to try to identify the challenges that we want to tackle, um, to kind of report back those results, use the media to help promote that back so that um, the community knows what, what you're doing and how you're moving forward. Um, make sure you're always uh, trying to seek support from community partners um, and get commitments from them and in, in what they're going to do to help you address the issue. And then always uh, make sure that you're following up quarterly with anyone who's making a commitment to take action or to do something so that um, the project doesn't fall by the wayside. One project idea that we've um, promoted from the US organization is uh, called Adopt a School. Most of our chapters have a school that's, uh, that's in their community or nearby their community. Um, and this can be a way that you can take um, action for, for a school district or an elementary school um, and do something to kind of help the school, but also use the tools in the active citizen framework to kind of figure out what you can do to make a difference and make an impact in the school. So instead of having to apply the active citizen framework to the community at large, you'd be applying it to a, to a school and what you could do um, to help make an impact in that smaller environment. So it makes it a little easier to kind of bite off um, and, and try it at the school level first and before you try to apply it to the community level. Um, and what can you start doing today to help make this happen? Well, the first thing you can do is identify some leaders that you want to start talking to. I highly recommend tonight while you're sitting there, um, write, jot down some names or some positions that, of people that you think are the people you want to talk to, uh, whether that be the mayor, uh, community supervisors, uh, United Way executives, uh, health department officials, uh, police department. Look at those different leaders in your community, the people that you that, that have a good finger on the pulse of what's going on. Write down their names and look up their contact information so that you can work on um, passing out those names to other members so that you can divide up the work and everyone builds a better contact list, uh, better, <clears throat> excuse me, better contacts within their community by starting to reach out to those community members. 
another step that you can take is start identifying the leaders in your organization who can help spearhead this process. Again, we, as we mentioned for the implementation steps, it's best to find somebody who's a proven leader, past president, past board member, um, who can help negotiate this process and, and uh, basically be your project manager and make sure that everyone in your chapter is getting involved in the process. Once you've identified your community leaders, actually call them. That's sometimes the hardest step that we have uh, getting this implemented is to start reaching out and making contact. So I encourage you to start, uh, once you've got the contact information put together, make a plan to contact uh, your community leaders. And start thinking about what those challenges are in your community that you think would be good for your organization to tackle. Um, Any time that we're going to try to build an active citizen framework project, it needs to have buy-in by the chapter. So what are some of the things that impact the people in our age group, our members? What are some things that impact them that we can start looking at and start doing this root cause analysis? I'd like to leave you all with a quote before I open up for questions. Um, and this is Margaret Mead. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of commit, uh, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. You can be the difference that you want to make in the world, and that's what this organization is all about. And that's what the Active Citizen Framework is there to help you do. So at this point, I'd like to open it up for any questions that anyone has um, and how we can help you implement this in your chapter for any questions about how the process works. And you can uh, raise your hand if you want. Well, if there are no questions, um, I thank everyone for your time for joining me tonight. Um, if you need to, if you have any questions, um, you can reach me at pcrawford at usjc's.org or you can contact uh, your state officer, national officers, um, the national headquarters for more information on the Active Citizen Framework, and we'd all be happy to help you in any way we can to start implementing this process. So thank you very much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. And again, if you have any questions, uh, my email address is pcrawford at usjcs.org.